This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at VAChamber.com. Virginia hospitals and health systems provide jobs. They support our economy and promote public health. Local hospitals are always open to help people with unexpected health needs. Having a stable health care network is vital. Virginia hospitals are our lifeline. It's amazing what my students with special needs can accomplish. Their pride is priceless. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association. Because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond. And a very special welcome back to delegates Rich Anderson, Mark Dudenheffer. Uh, Mark, welcome back after two years of uh, off on some other duty. I was on vacation. On vacation. Yes. For, leave. You were on leave, Colonel. On, on leave, <laughs> yes. Right. Terminal leave, I thought, for yeah. a while. Uh, if any, if any of the language coming out at the beginning sounds like that I'm talking to two colonels, uh, then that's the case. And so you've been on leave, but you're now back on active duty. That's right. Here at the General Assembly. That's correct. And Delegate Anderson here since 2010. Mm -hmm. Now yep. into Thank the you. third session. So let's uh, bring our, our viewers up to date okay. on, on what's happening this session on veterans issues and even about the number of veterans that serve uh, in the General Assembly. We were talking some about that before the show, okay. so go ahead and you all fill them in. Well, well I'll kick it off. Um, I serve as co chair with Senator Bryce Reeves of uh, the General Assembly Military and Veterans Caucus, which is a joint House-Senate venture. We consider everyone who is a member of the General Assembly to be a member of that caucus. Um, we have a pretty robust participation from both House and Senate and both parties. And so uh, we kind of are the clearinghouse for any military and veterans legislation that traverses um, the General Assembly. Um, it's kind of a unifying issue, so it's a, it's a piece of uh, focus that I really enjoy. Presently in the General Assembly, um, we have within the House 21 members of the 100 member body are veterans, so 21 percent. And over in the Senate, 11 or a little over, you know, one tenth are veterans. So taken in the aggregate, about 23 plus percent of our 140 legislators between both houses are veterans, and so they bring personal experience and perspective um, to what we try to do to make uh, Virginia the most veteran-friendly state in the country. We were talking before the show too about on the on the federal level in the 19, early 1970s, it was close to 80 percent in both the uh, House of Representatives and the Senate, and how that chart, if you look at the charts, come down lower than Virginia, down to about 20 yeah. percent in Congress right now. So mm -hmm. Virginia. As you were saying, during your time since 2010, it's holding pretty steady at 22, 23 percent. Right. Well, it's frustrating to, um, when you discuss some of these issues, to hear people that have never had any experience in it say some things that, that Rich and I know, or, you know, it's like, no, nah, that's not how it works, you know. But it's uh, it, it, the 23 members, and I, I think the entire bipartisan uh, members of the House are very, very much proactive veterans. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we've shown that in the amount of legislation that, we, that we've that we passed and the goal to be the most veteran-friendly state in the United States, I think, uh, is, is attainable, and I think we're reaching for that. You know, if our viewers hear and read very little about veterans legislation, it's because people are working together. There's not a fight on it. 
That's right. The, the, there's no, there's yeah, no yeah. huge so, public footprint that's right. regarding that's, that. that. That's right. But but there are some every year. There are some important issues that yep. you all deal with. And exactly. What would be some of the ones that you're wrestling with? Maybe some of them you've already solved for this session, but others are still winding down. What what are the issues? I, I think a lot of the legislation usually centers around education and um, trying to provide ed, you know transition workplace uh, type training and but also you know edu free education for veterans who come back from from Iraq and uh, and from the you know war situations and stuff um, Rich probably has the uh, well for me um, one of the big issues that we're tackling on behalf of Virginia veterans is construction of two additional Virginia veterans care centers to join right. the already right. existing two facilities one is in Roanoke and the other is uh, here in Richmond. Both are co-located with their uh, Veterans Administration counterpart facilities. And so the vision is to um, um, do some bonding authority, and I think we're well on track to have this happen because everybody agrees on it. Right. And uh, the goal is to uh, fill out that network of Virginia Veterans Care Centers and place one in Northern Virginia and the other in Hampton Roads, which presently don't have coverage. And so there's several venues competing in Northern Virginia, several in Hampton Roads, and sometime this summer um, a decision will be made exactly where to place them, and the hope is in late 2017 uh, to break ground. So um, Mark and I are both on that piece of legislation. Um, it's actually been spearheaded by Majority Leader Kirk Cox, and we've joined with him to, to make it happen. And it fills the gap. That we you know, all veterans know is that exists in the federal programs that are there, and uh, we haven't let that push us back. Mm -hmm. We're we're stepping and leaning forward to helping those veterans in that in that area where there's a gap in services and in information and support. There's just the sheer number of veterans in the Commonwealth of Virginia make it impossible for the Federal Veterans Administration to service all their needs. And so many states, including Virginia, have developed a pretty uh, robust um, state-level counterpart organizations in Virginia. Um, the Department of Veteran Services, DVS, administers those programs and hopefully will be overseeing a total of four Virginia Veterans Care Centers. And, and for our viewers, uh, maybe particularly those who are not veterans, would be interested in knowing the very creative <coughs> process that Virginia used last year and moving on this year to establish those with money not coming from the federal government in a timely fashion That's to go right. ahead and do some bonding I was pretty and let that, let that money come and pay back. Correct. Yeah. I was pretty involved in that. Yes. Um, the construction of these state Virginia Veterans Care Centers consists of a mixture of federal and state money. Um, the Commonwealth pays about 34, I believe, percent of the cost, and uh, the federal government picks up the rest. Well, there's a very long list, waiting list, mm -hmm. for these federal funds, and our forecast was that um, it would be better than a decade to get those monies. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. legislative and executive branches got together mm -hmm. and said, what we're going to do to meet the needs of Virginia veterans, we're just going to roll the fiscal dice go ahead and build these on our own, and then in the out years apply for federal reimbursement. If uh, that comes, that's superb. If it doesn't, then we were willing to take that risk on behalf of Virginia veterans. And Mark, after your two years on vacation or uh, <coughs> inactive duty at that time, as you've come back, what's, what's some of the legislation that you're working on, veterans or otherwise, this session? Uh, the um well, I mean, veterans is pretty much front and center. I, um, I've i tried to concentrate. I have, uh, the, the state owns about 1,100 acres of, of land on the Potomac River in, in Stafford County. Stafford has zero access to citizens there to the river. So um, working really hard. I, I worked on that uh, three, four years ago and also trying to get extra money now so we can we can develop that for the um, for the citizens in that part of the, the Commonwealth to be able to uh, get access to one of the great natural um, recreational areas that we have where right now we don't have that so um, I um, I introduced some legislation this year that needs a little more work I was told but I think um, 
it's important that we start looking at ways to improve the way we do we do government, way we do customer service, and it's mostly an executive branch. But there's a, um, a process used in um, business and now in government called lean government. It's a it's a you know robust way of looking at processes. It's a robust way of dealing with uh, in the, the civilian side customers, but in our side, our constituents. Um, uh, it'll involve the inspector general's office. So I, you know, I have some expertise, some people that are working with me on this that are much more um, detail oriented when it comes to that. But I think the the administration really was, they, you know, they they were interested in what we were doing. I just think uh, we we're going to need to work on some details. So when you hear people say that we should run our government more like a business, this. This is an apparatus or a mechanism of actually implementing some of those those types of practices, and then it is a process. It's not something that happens at one time. It's a it's a continuing process. Uh, it's something that's being used in Virginia by the Department of Corrections now. So it's not new, right? Um, right. But I think uh, uh, the legislature's role in this will be to you know try and uh, allocate some funds and, and nudge the the executive branch further and further into these efficiencies. Oh, so that's something we can watch for in 2017. Oh, yeah. Or, yes, yes. I'm not going away. <laughs> right. <laughs> we don't give up easy. <laughs> right. He's a Marine. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and, and so what is the Air Force Colonel working on? Well, uh, probably my major thrust this year was a continuation of two previous years, and that is to better define the use of uh, handheld devices in automobiles, it right. has produced an epidemic number of deaths and injuries um, across the Commonwealth. Uh, it's always technology that stays ahead of the rule set. And so the rule set is always running to catch up with technology. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in prior years, I carried a bill uh, with one of my colleagues on the Senate side, which uh, took texting while driving and elevated it from a secondary to a primary offense. and and increase the uh, monetary penalties for first and follow-on um, infractions. Um, but what that did was that controlled the actual act of emailing or texting while driving. But what we have learned is that the accident trends have continued at their same pace, unabated, simply because there are all these other applications that can be used in automobiles. I have sat in rooms with literally dozens of families who have lost loved ones, and so mm -hmm. there's a human face on it for me. And as a result, uh, I carried a bill this year um, to uh, uh, severely limit um, the types of activities that can take place in the vehicle, regulating it much like uh, uh, drinking while driving, because texting while driving statistically is the same degree of mm -hmm. impairment. Not distraction, it is truly impairment. And so uh, what the Transportation Committee elected to do, and I wholly support this, is they continued the bill to 2017, and they have reported it to the Joint Commission on Transportation Accountability so that we can collect the right mm. brains together to uh, craft a bill that can withstand scrutiny. Because as you can imagine, um, the immense legal challenges at crafting a very precise bill that governs the behaviors, but retains the ability, at least hands-free, to have telephone conversations in your vehicle. Go back to something you said before. Was it the same distraction or <clears throat> mm -hmm. the same impairment, even as drinking and driving? Yes. Every wow. piece of research, David, has wow. indicated That's... that it is the same degree of impairment. It results in closely aligned numbers of accidents, deaths, and injuries. And so that's why we're trying to address this. We don't hesitate as a General Assembly to uh, prescribe um, limitations on what can happen in the consumption of alcohol and operation of motor vehicles. We need to do the same thing because undeniably the end result are deaths and injuries. And certainly road safety, you know, we, you hear a lot of talk about congestion and um, and its effect on quality of life, but nothing is, is more dreadful in quality of life than to lose a loved one. And our teenagers are much more susceptible, not, not at, we're, I'm guilty of it sometimes, but the teenagers are, they already have certain impairments and stuff. It's important that we, uh, 
that we educate them, that we try and build in safety features in our roads, but also uh, affect the graduated licensing and mm -hmm. the, the, um, the penalties and stuff for texting and, and keep up with the technology that's there. Uh, texting is only one of the things you can do on your cell phone. You can look at Google Maps or you can look at Facebook. I mean, there's just a, a, an unlimited number of opportunities to lose track of what's happening in front of you on the road. Mm -hmm. In preparing for this, one interesting data point for you, which surprised me, was the demographic, the age group, that is the greatest perpetrator of accidents by texting behind the wheel is ages from the early 50s into the early 60s. Interesting. Yes, that's yeah. an interesting yeah. Yeah, data I, I would point. Have, I would have thought it's the 18 the, to 28 or DMV <laughs> provided me with those, those maybe, numbers. Maybe I'm they think surprised. faster. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but uh, I think they do it at a much more robust pace than, you know, I'm in that age group, so i got to be careful about <laughs> what I say. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. Even you know, on the sidewalks, if you're around <laughs> Capitol Square, there, there are occasions that... I move over because someone is walking and texting, and I don't want to really have a crash in walking, although it wouldn't hurt that much. David, uh, I've seen people walk into telephone poles yeah. texting. Yeah. I hate to say it, but I yes. drive a little bit of glee and see that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, I think about a year ago, and I don't remember what university, it wasn't one of the Virginia ones, that had three stairways to some building, an up and a down, and a texting one. <laughs> I never really? heard yeah, that. They, uh, they, because there was well, so much texting going on. The technology exists, and we right. should harness the technology for the good that it represents. We just simply have to embrace a rule set so that we don't have these uh, unintended consequences. Well, it right. certainly changed how we do, a lot of us do business. I mean, I, if you get up in the gallery and take a picture at any one time of what's going on on the floor, you'll, you'll probably see a third of the, the delegates are communicating with someone on the But the beauty center. is... We have never seen a delegate or a senator crash their desk <laughs> on the House floor. Right, right, right. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, and as you're working on that, you'll have to work on devices like this where someone yes. can get a text while driving and glance I've seen down those. Those are becoming popular. I've seen several people and, with them. And scroll up and answer mm -hmm. and have the eyes off of the, mm -hmm. off of the road. We're having this conversation <clears throat> just before the Sunday when the budgets will be Right. unveil when our viewers are seeing it they will be reading about pay raises for teachers or this or that or other things that are starting to, mm -hmm. to, to, to come out um, any any comments about the the fiscal matters of the Commonwealth or about budget that you all would want to make knowing that when people see this it will be after the budget right is um, well of course we are at the halfway point or just beyond and uh, we have been, we're, we on the Appropriations Committee, which is the Budget Writing Committee, have been working on that now uh, since really December 17th when the governor right. came over here to the General Assembly building and pitched his bill over the transom and then mm -hmm. it was, as we say, in the bosom of the committee. Yes. So where we are now is uh, we've worked to refine that. The subcommittees have met and reported out their, uh, their work. I believe there are eight subcommittees. I serve on three of those. And uh, Sunday we'll gather here at 1 o'clock uh, to brief the individual pieces of the budget. And then uh, it'll go to the House floor next week and then over to the Senate and then let the work really begin. Yes. Yes. So, again, as our viewers are seeing this, it'll be really approaching the last two weeks of the session right. where things really get in a crunch. That's why, that's why they add the two weeks to the end so yeah, that we, right. uh, we have a that's lot more right. time to concentrate on that part of the right. Right. Of what we do here. All right, and one of the rules changes just this year is the an extended, what is it, 48 hours 40 time hours. That, that you will have an opportunity mm -hmm. to see it. And I think others can go online yeah. and be able to view. So people around the Commonwealth. I like that. Actually, I wish it was a, probably a little bit longer. Longer. But yeah. i got to tell you, um, um, I just think that that is a great initiative that the speaker took. Yes. Simply because there is nothing... Uh, worse than having to sit on the House floor and press a red or a green button, and yet you've been given insufficient time to understand the issue. And the same goes for the public, because yeah. Mark and I really look to our our folks back home. 
And transparency is such a visible, it's a visible, it's such an issue now that I, I think that we need to continue to, to provide government earlier. I, I'd like to see some of the iterations of the budget be more visible to the public and to me and to some of the legislators. If you're not on appropriations, sometimes it becomes a, a far off process that mm -hmm. you're depending on others to, to do. So, um, but transparency and just about everything we do is critical for the public to know that we're, we're doing their work. Mm -hmm. We're trying very hard to do their work and the best we can with the resources we have. That's a good way to end the end this portion of the show and I'm wanting to thank both of you uh, representing Prince William and Prince William and Stafford and also in some sense representing your colleagues who are on the caucus that deals mm -hmm. with veterans issues. So thank, mm -hmm. thank you both for thank being you. on This Week in Richmond. Tell our viewers to stay tuned because we have just a, a segment coming up to tell them something about the Governor's Fellows Program. So right. we'll be right back. Thank, Thank you, you very much for having us. Thank you. Delighted to have a very special guest who's going to give us some very helpful information people need to listen to, particularly if they have someone who, who would qualify for this program. Asif Bobnagri. Correct. Did it? Did yeah. It? Okay. Yeah, got uh, it. Uh, the governor's press office. So tell us about the governor's fellows program. Sure. Well, the fellows program is a, is a program that dates back to 1982. Uh, really solid um, program that gives you great experience into what state government, especially on the executive side, is really like. Um, you know, my, me, myself, I was a part of the capital semester program here at VCU. And so I understood how that um, kind of gave me the legislative side. But it's really good to get some sort of executive experience seeing how cabinet secretaries work, the day-to-day -day operations in the Patrick Henry building work. And so um, that's what the fellows program allows. And um, you know, there have been some great, great fellows that have, have come out of that program. I mean, when I say uh, you know, former secretary, former assistant secretary of agriculture and forestry, Carrie Cheenery, she was a fellow. The current secretary of the Commonwealth, LeVar Stoney, he was a fellow. So you really, when you go through the program, you see kind of how executive branch works. You see how, you know, different, different roles, whether that be constituent services, whether that you be placed in the agriculture and forestry, you see kind of how those roles work and, and how to, um, the day-to-day -day operations of state government at that level works. And moving forward, how to really uh, advance and use those skills into creating a, uh, a career for yourself, whether that be in the state government or lobbying or, you know, whatever it might be. So, so March 15th is the deadline. It is. Uh, we're going to have up on the screen <clears throat> so people can go to uh, get the information. If, if they don't take down this particular website, they just go to the governor's website and then they can easily find. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if you're interested in applying, March 15th is the deadline. Um, and, and it really, we, the application is all online. We tried to make it very simple, very easy for folks to really get on, go to governor.virginia.gov, and then you look, you look under the administration, you'll see the fellows. So um, we recreated a brand new face, uh, government page uh, for the f online, and it's actually, Excellent. yeah, it's Excellent. great. It, you know, we revamped it completely. We redid the application. Last year was a little lengthy. We kind of made it a little shorter so folks didn't seem as Know, taxing to fill it out, but also enough to make it thorough so folks are able to really get together, understand, and, and fill it out and take the time to answer the questions, make, give us reference letters, and also uh, you know, making sure that they have people to uh, call in on behalf of right, them. Right. So how, how, many, how many fellows each year? Each, you know, each year really depends on what the secretaries need. We, we like to give them a little uh, advance notice. How many fellows do you need this year? How many projects are you working on? Okay. Um, typically, last year we had about 30. That was our, our largest class I, that we've had in a while, uh, in my knowledge. So we're trying to, um, it'll probably be around the 20 to 25 range this year. Um, you know, we, we like to see what the secretaries need, so we're still kind of working through that process. 
So someone is, <coughs> works with the same secretary for the, for the eight-week term? Yes, yeah. correct. And yeah. so the program runs two months, um, and they'll be working with that secretary. Sometimes secretaries, just to give you a, a change-up of pace, instead of working in their office, they'll kind of put you into one of the agencies and see how those that, that relationship works out. Right. So I know in fellows in past uh, with the Secretary of Administration, they've done part of their time with the secretary and part of their time with the Department of Elections, for example, to see kind of how that, that runs. Um, it's a really unique opportunity to see what state government and how that kind of correlation between the agencies and the secretary it is. So I think that's a unique experience in it of itself. So, so the time now, this is the last, but as our viewers are seeing this around the Commonwealth, they've got about two more weeks. They need to get that application in. Yes. And also, thank you very much for being on This Week in Richmond and giving the plug to this very exciting and, and very significant program for young people to be here for the, the summer. Absolutely. We highly encourage all rising seniors and graduates to apply. Uh, really, I think it, you'll benefit far greater than right. what you think. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. For jobs, the economy, and public health, Virginia Hospitals, our lifeline. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.